Secretary Sean Spicer. Sean, thanks for coming on. Thanks, so, Tucker. Congratulations on the show. Oh, well, thank you. So you were obviously there when this happened, but there was this really interesting exchange with Jim Acosta from CNN, uh, who kept trying to ask a question, and the president-elect finally said, no, I'm not taking a question from you, you're fake news. Here's what Jim Acosta said about you later in an interview on his channel, CNN. He said, quote, after I asked and demanded that we have a question, Sean Spicer, the incoming press secretary, you, did say to me that if I were to do that again, I was going to be thrown out of this press conference. Did that happen? So what happened was, after the exchange that you just noted, he did it again towards the end. He continued to harass the president-elect. After the president-elect had ended the press conference and been removed from the area, I went up to Mr. Acosta and I said that his behavior was rude, inappropriate, and disrespectful to the president-elect. He right. told me that he thought that he had a right to ask a question, even though CNN had been granted a question to one of their other correspondents. I informed him that I thought that no one should be treated that way and treated that disrespectfully. And that if he did it again in the future, I would have him removed. I don't, Tucker, you know, I've known you a long time. You know I'm a pretty solid Republican. I don't care whether you're a Republican or Democrat or an independent, but if someone did that to President Obama or President Clinton or frankly any other human being, I would say the same thing. No one needs to be treated with that level of disrespect and rudeness. I think Mr. Acosta owes the president-elect, and frankly, the entire press corps, an apology for his childish and inappropriate behavior. So the president-elect basically made that same point. I mean, from the podium, he said, you're fake news. And it got me thinking that during the campaign, there were news organizations that were banned from Trump events. And I'm sort of wondering now why. I mean, the, the president-elect is certainly capable of responding directly to people he doesn't like in the media. He's pretty good at it, and I think he probably gets some sympathy from viewers when he does it. So why would he ban news organizations when he so clearly enjoys batting him around? Well, he's not, and I think that's the answer to the presidency. He is committed uh, to ensuring that the people's house has access to the press. And, and again, I don't think yeah. you're going to see that, but I think that what the, what the president-elect did today is something he's done in the past. He's going to do it again. He's going to set the record straight. He's not going to let dishonest members of the media have factually inaccurate stories about him, his administration, or his attempts to make this country better without him responding and responding forcefully. And that's the right. thing, is that I think for a lot of these folks in the media, they're used to the, these politicians sitting back and taking it. And that's not who Donald Trump is. He fights back and he wins. So he, the, the story really today was about BuzzFeed, which printed that dossier uh, on its website, 35 pages of what you say is totally false uh, allegations about Donald Trump. You describe BuzzFeed today from the podium, I'm quoting, as a hugely irresponsible left-wing blog that was openly hostile to Trump during the campaign, all of which is demonstrably true. And yet it was the RNC. Nice. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's accurate. I mean, on, on the merits, you're right. But the RNC, as I remember, during the campaign, reserved over a million dollars of space, signed a contract with BuzzFeed to put Trump ads on BuzzFeed. Why would the RNC do business with an irresponsible left-wing blog that was hostile to its candidate? Well, so that's a great question. It's twofold, though. First of all, let me just be clear. The story that BuzzFeed posted last night, its own editor put as a footnote that they were unsure of the information that they were putting out, and they should be taken with caution because it right. was unsubstantiated. So, I mean, just to be clear about the story that they published themselves. But second of all, to get to your question about the campaign, we reserve time across 56 different platforms. So everything from, you know, the Daily Caller, Fox News, uh, BuzzFeed. Right. And the idea was we didn't have to put any money down we could reserve uh, time and ads across over 50 platforms, whereas we came down the final stretch of the election. If our data told us the missing voters were on the Huffington Post, or if they were on Newsmax, or if they were on FoxNews.com, that we had the time reserved to go after those key constituencies where we knew that we had to get out the vote. The idea was to cover all of our bases across, across the political spectrum to be ready to ensure that we had the capability to go after the voters we needed. And frankly, if you look at the election in terms of the states that we did, we had an amazing candidate with an amazing message, and he combined that with an amazing data and digital operation and field operation that propelled us to victory. So we did exactly the right thing. We'll do it again. And I think it's going to be the gold standard going forward. But did you really think you were going to find Trump voters on an irresponsible left-wing blog? Well, I think in the summer of, of last year, in the when we reserved the time, 
The goal was April. to make sure that wherever we knew they were going to be, that we knew that there were people, for, even on the far left, that were upset with Hillary Clinton, that didn't trust her, that were open to a Trump message. You look at the number right. of people who supported Bernie Sanders. So sure, absolutely, we had to be prepared. And again, we put no money down across any platform. We reserve time to ensure that no matter where those voters were, and when you look at the breadth and depth of the vote and the movement that Donald Trump commanded, it wasn't just about Republicans and the conservatives. It was about independents, disaffected right. Democrats and liberals that were ready for change. And so we did exactly the right thing back then. I think that's I think that's a fair point. So let me just uh, finally put in a plea to you. So I know that you're going to redo in ways that are not yet clear the way the press operation works at the White House and is probably overdue. And you're probably going to bring in a lot of people who haven't been allowed in the briefing in the past. And that's fine with me. But here's what I hope you guys don't do, which previous presidents, including the current one, have done assiduously, which is reserve interviews only for camp followers, for throne sniffers, for people who already agree with them. So you see President Obama doing interviews with, well, BuzzFeed and NPR and all these puffy little backlit pieces that he does, but never letting someone who asks real questions near him. Will you allow people who are going to really ask questions, hard questions, near President Trump? Absolutely. Look what he did today. Every one of the mainstream medias, some of the left wing media all got questions in. Uh, he's not afraid to, for, of anybody right now. And I think you aptly noted with respect to CNN, he's not a, he's not afraid to back down from anybody. Right, left, independent, center. Uh, he is tough. He's going to answer the questions uh, and, and deliver a very forceful message. So I don't think it has to do with the outlet. He'll take on anybody and deliver the, the message that he's going to make this country better again, wherever that wherever whoever wants to hear it and is willing to give him a shake for it. Does, does he like the brawling, or does he just seem to like the brawling? I mean, to the extent you can no, absolutely. You know, no, no, speak but, for but his again, mood, he seems he to like it. No, no, he... he he enjoys actually talking about what he wants to do to make the country better again. He enjoys talking about the successes that he's had, whether it's carrier, uh, creating jobs with SoftBank or, or Sprint or bringing down the, the, the tax burden that people are having to pay for the F-35 or the new Air Force One. But I think what happens is when people want to engage negatively with him or attack him, he's going to fight back. If you want to have right. a conversation and engage in a polite and respectful manner with the president-elect, he's going to treat you in kind. But if you come in hot and want to be disrespectful and rude, as Jim Acosta was today, he's not going to sit back and take it. This is a man who fights and wins. Noticed. Sean Spicer, thanks a lot for joining us, and congrats on the new job. Thanks, Tucker.